one thing I would like to mention before beginning, I've got a lot of information to cover in this film and it's going to run a little over 11 minutes long. So you're going to need a little bit of time to watch it. So please bear with me. Strolling along, we are in Holy Sepulchre Cemetery, located in the Chicago suburb of Alsip, Illinois. We are coming up to the gravesite of one Frank McEarlane. Born in 1894 and dying on October 8th of 1932, Frank is located in Section 2, Block 9, Lot 10 of the cemetery. Born in Chicago, McEarlane's first arrest came in 1911. He was sent to Pontiac Prison for involvement in a car theft ring. After getting out of prison and while on parole, he was arrested eight months later as an accessory in the murder of Oak Park police officer Herman Mallow. After being convicted of this crime, he was sent to Joliet Prison for one year. After an attempt to escape, he was sent to another two years in prison. When prohibition became the law of the land, McGurlene aligned himself with partner Joseph Pollock Josaltis. The duo operated their territory in an area on the south side of Chicago, known as the Back of the Yards section, the name derived from being in close proximity to the stockyards. By 1922, McCurlane and his partner Saltis were aligned with the Torrio Capone outfit against the South Side O'Donnell brothers, which was headed by Edward Spike O'Donnell. Standing a mere 5 foot 8 and weighing roughly 190 pounds, McCurlane was known as an extremely ferocious assassin, kind of psychotic in nature. Being a devout Catholic, McCurlane was known to carry a rosary nestled right next to his pistol. He was known to partake in a little bit too much of what he sold, and oftentimes would slip into an alcoholic psychosis. During the Beer Wars of 1923, psychopathic killer McCurlane would be credited with single-handedly murdering three Southside O'Donnell gangsters in September of 1923. The O'Donnell henchmen who were ultimately murdered were Jerry O'Connor, George Meegan, and George Butcher. On December 1st of 1923, two O'Donnell beer trucks were waylaid on the road between Chicago and Joliet. The occupants of one of the trucks were William Shorty Egan and Thomas Morey Keene. The duo were shoved into a car with McCurlane and his buddy Willie Channel. Egan survived the life-ending car ride while Keene did not. Despite having half his face blown off, Egan had amazingly and shockingly lived to tell his side of the story about surviving the attempted one-way ride, and fingered Willie Channel as one of his attackers. McCurlane was eventually arrested, but he beat both this case and the charges in the double homicide of George Butcher and George Megan, who were riddled with hot lead while driving home on September 17th of 1923. With that said, McCurlane's erratic and insane behavior only got worse. On May 4th of 1924, he was drinking it up in a Crown Point, Indiana saloon with two friends, John O'Reilly and Alex McCabe. Both men egged McCurlane on into demonstrating his marksmanship abilities. McCurlane picked a random target sitting at the end of the bar, an attorney by the name of Thaddeus S. Fancher and murdered him in cold blood with a single gunshot to the head. O'Reilly would eventually be convicted of the murder and sentenced to life in prison. McCabe got a life sentence as well, but eventually won his freedom on appeal when the chief witness against him was beaten to death. By 1925, rival Southside gang boss Spike O'Donnell had reinforced his gang and once again instigated a war with the Saltis McCurlane mob, who also found themselves in conflict with the Sheldon gang. That summer, all the major Southside gangs began shooting at one another. McCurlane was a prime suspect in the July 23rd murder of George Carroll and the September 3rd murder of William Dickman. McCurlane was not charged in either murder. However, he was about to make England history. It is stated that some organized crime historians believe that McCurlane acquired his Tommy gun from Northside gang leader Dean O'Banion, who had acquired several of these deadly weapons from a friend Louis Altieri in Denver, Colorado.
At any rate, McCrulean was to use one of these deadly pieces of artillery in his attempt to murder Spike O'Donnell. On September 25th of 1925, O'Donnell was talking to a beat cop in front of a drugstore at the corner of 63rd Avenue and Western Avenue in Chicago. A car pulled up and an unknown person, possibly McCurlin, yelled out, Hello, Spike. The Southside gang leader, sensing what was about to happen next, hit the ground as the submachine gun started spitting hot lead. Miraculously, no one was hurt in this assassination attempt, as the machine gunners finished what they were doing and sped off into the unknown. The Chicago police were so unfamiliar with this weapon that it was noted the gun must have been a shotgun or rifle of some sort. It was the first recorded use of a submachine gun in Chicago, or any other major American city for that matter. A few days later, on October 3rd, McCurlin used his trusty Thompson, a.k.a. the Tommy Gun, to shoot up the Reagan's Colts Clubhouse, murdering a Sheldon gangster Charles Kelly in the process. Depending on who you ask, this murder would officially or unofficially be the first Tommy Gun fatality. McCurlin was also suspected of shooting up Buff Castillo's bar on the 10th of February, 1926 wounding Sheldon gangsters William Wilson and John Mitters Foley. Newspaper headlines of the era stated, Machine Gun Gang Shoots too." Both Chicago Police Captain John Stidge and Al Capone commented on the deadly power of the weapon. Both of the respective organizations set out to arm themselves with the formidable piece of machinery. The age of the Tommy Gun had arrived. On April 22nd of 1926, McCurlin was finally arrested for the murder of Thaddeus Fancher. He wouldn't be extradited to Indiana until the following August. It is noted that McCurlin showed up to court on at least one occasion totally plastered, you know, drunk. On November 3rd of 1927, after the murder of one witness and much changed testimony, McCurlin would be acquitted on Fancher's murder. As the Roaring Twenties closed, Joe Saltis was acquitted in the murder of John Mitters Foley and eventually retired to his estate in Wisconsin. McGurlian pretty much kept out of the spotlight until January 28th of 1930, when he was rushed to the hospital after being shot in the left leg. The slug had struck above the knee and fractured his leg. McGurlian claimed that he had accidentally shot himself while cleaning a revolver but police suspected that his common-law wife, Alfreda Regis, a.k.a. Marianne Miller, may have shot him. The duo had quite the turbulent relationship and oftentimes had high decibel alcohol-infused fights. Another possible suspect was gangster John Dingbat Operta, with whom McCurlin had been feuding with at the time of the shooting. On the night of February 24th, McCurlin was propped on his hospital bed with his healing leg still in traction when three gunmen barged in and started shooting. As this was going on, McCurlin pulled out an automatic pistol from under his pillow and returned fire. While his shots missed, they scared off his would-be assassins. One of his assassins dropped a forty-five automatic pistol in his departure. McCurlin had been winged three times in the melee, and keeping to the code of silence, shrugged off questions as to who shot him. In a cryptic manner, McCurlin mentioned that he had to take care of it. Just after McGurlin was released from the hospital on March 5th, John Dingbat Oberta was found shot to death in his car on the outskirts of Chicago. The lifeless body of Oberta's driver and bodyguard, Sam Malaga, lay face down in an icy puddle of water several feet away. The 45 caliber pistol left in McGurlin's hospital room had been traced to Malaga. Frank had indeed taken care of it. McCurlin's behavior continued to worsen. Years of excessive consumption of Prohibition-era bootleg booze had taken its toll on his mental state. On June 8th of 1931, an intoxicated McCurlin riddled a South Shore Drive block with shotgun blasts. He was apparently shooting at imaginary foes out to kill him. The police ultimately filed a whopping total of five simultaneous charges which included, but not limited to, being drunk and disorderly, carrying a concealed weapon, firing a shotgun indiscriminately around his neighborhood, driving with forged license plates, and biting his sister on the cheek. 
On October 8th of 1931, McCurlin was driving his car with common-law wife Alfreda Rigas. Also in the car were her two German Shepherd dogs. The police later determined that both McCurlin and Rigas were extremely drunk and arguing with each other. At one point, McCurlin finally snapped. After pulling over in front of 8129 Phillips Avenue, McCurlin whirled around and fired four fatal shots into Alfreda. Tired of the barking dogs, McCurlin shot and killed them as well. After this little psychotic and homicidal episode, McCurlin's remaining underworld associates and friends allegedly raised a retirement fund of sorts of several hundred dollars in order to get rid of the dangerously unstable sugar-happy gangster. McCurlin thus retired to a lavishly furnished houseboat located on the Illinois River in Beardstown, Illinois. In the fall of 1932, McCurlin fell ill with pneumonia. In his delirium, he was convinced that rival gangsters were coming to his hospital room to kill him. It took over four attendants to hold him down in his rage. One thing I would like to mention before finishing up. While I was panning over the area, you probably noticed the gravesites of Vincent McCurlin, who was Frank McCurlin's brother, and one John Conlin, who was Frank McCurlin's bodyguard. John died in July of 1926.